That's right, we're here, 4.07 in the afternoon, day before the primary, folks, and uh, we have two interviews left to do, and tomorrow is voting day. I certainly hope you will get out and vote and be knowledgeable when you vote. If you have any questions about any of the candidates that we've interviewed, all you have to do is go to wcrs1450am.net, and there are podcasts there for all of the candidates on the candidate page. But uh, I'm Ann Eller, and this afternoon I'm here with Joyce Dickerson. How are you doing today, Joyce? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Thank you so very much for having me today. Absolutely. <laughs> this, is, this is great. Mm -hmm. Now, you are a Democrat running uh, for the seat that is currently occupied by Senator Tim Scott. That is correct. And what made you decide to run? Well, I tell you what, I was looking uh, in the paper, this was back in August, and I believe the date was like maybe August 28th, 29th, uh, and then I saw where two other guys were thinking, of, they were thinking about running for this office, and when I read that, it just kind of resonated, I'm like, you know, we got two other guys, we already have all the guys right now from, from South Carolina, all we have is male representatives, mm -hmm. and then it was like, honestly, I'm really very spiritual, so, you know, it's like, I believe that it was like, it was a divine appointment that said, you know, why don't you do it? And I'm like, oh, wow, I don't know about this. You know, that was like really frightening. But uh, the more I thought about it, I said, you know what, why not me? Um, we don't have any women uh, for the state of South Carolina. And uh, the last I checked, I'm a woman. <laughs> Sounds good, Joyce. <laughs> and because of that, I'm thinking, you know, this would be a great opportunity for a woman to run for this office. And so... I spoke with my husband and he looked at me like I had dropped off of a turnip truck or something like, what did you say? And I said, well, um, I think this is an opportunity for a female to run for the, for the U.S. Senate. And I said, the seat basically um, is basically, in my opinion, is, is open because, um, because of the appointment um, sure. with um, Senator Scott. And all due respect to Senator Scott, I would never call him Tim, but you know, all due respect to Senator Scott, I think that... Um, you know, since he was selected, and he got one vote. I'm like, boy, that's pretty good. If you can get elected to be a senator on one vote, man, just think what I can do with three. If I can get my husband, my two, my, my children, that'll be three votes. <laughs> so, but to lay all jokes aside, um, I thought it was a great opportunity for a woman to run for this office. So I, I went to my party and told them what my intents were after I had a little conversation with the Lord, my family. I went to my party, and they looked at me and they said, well, Joyce, uh, that's a big, big undertaking. Um, you know what you'll be up against with uh, Senator Scott? And I said, yeah, I thought about it. And I went and talked to my congressman, and uh, that is Congressman Clyburn. He says, Joyce, you know he has a lot of money. I said, yeah, but wouldn't it be crazy if we just let him keep all the money and don't have any opposition and nobody challenge him? Next year he'll have even more money. <coughs> so I decided, well, why don't he spend a little bit of it on me? Okay. <laughs> so, so I got into the race with zero dollars, and I went to my husband, and I said, honey, can you advance me along because I'm going to run for this office, and he did. And that's how we got started. We filed all our paperwork. We didn't think any more about it. We just did it and uh, filed the paperwork, and uh, from there, it's, it's the rest is history. We've been running ever since October 29th. Well, that's great. We actually had uh, Congressman Clyburn in studio last week talking about his new book. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So he was in studio with us and then went over to the Mays house and uh, did a uh, nice book signing over there at the Mays house. I heard about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was very nice. Mm -hmm. So um, now, Joyce, what do you, you're retired from, uh, from a compliance auditor from an insurance auditing company. Yes, basically what we did was uh, I worked for a small company and I worked for that for a long time. But basically, for, first of all, let me back up and tell you what I really want to make sure we get to this point. Uh, my husband was in the military, and uh, I married really young. And basically, You've been married 50 years. I've been married 50 years, and um, I think we look very good for 50 years, I think. I mean, <laughs> and what, how old are you? Uh, 68 years yeah, old. Yeah, that's you married young. We can now figure that out. <laughs> and just add the, do the math. Yeah, and do the, the math, do right. The math. But anyhow, um, by him, we traveled so much, and so we basically what we did was um, I worked basically everywhere I was. And so... I went to um, school when I first got out, I, I became a cosmetologist, it was quite a successful one. And then I had my children in, in the meantime, so I was able, my husband was able to allow me to be home with my kids and raise my, raise my children. And um, I decided to go back to college late. 
I went to Mittens Tech and I found out I could really do college stuff. You know, yeah. It was really fun. And so I matriculated to Benedict College where I got a degree in accounting, um, BS in accounting and management. Um, and so from that, uh, I went into paralegal. So I worked for a paralegal, one of the top um, black firms in Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, I did that paralegal for six years, and I'm thinking maybe I need to go to law school. So I, <laughs> I'm a very Joyce Dickerson. I, I got yeah. energy to burn, and right. I'm like, exactly. you know. So I said I should go to law school, and and from that, this opportunity opened up, and. Uh, so um, the young lady, she offered me this opportunity of a lifetime, so I was able to retire from her company. She had a really lucrative company. She brought me in. She was just very good. We got we got along very good, and I can call her name. I'm not going to tell her company, but it was Mary Rickman, and she really did a lot to inspire me to do a lot of things, and so we had a lot of fun, and that was a great job. And then I turned 62. And I came home to my husband uh, after being re-elected on Richland County Council, and I said to him, honey, can I afford to come home? He said, yes. I said, well, good. I'm going to do an early retirement. And I, I early retired out. I opted out at, 65, at 62. So, so uh, you've been enjoying your Social Security and your, and your Medicare? Yes, 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 yes. Every day of my life. And when I go to the, I love it. I'm, I tell everybody, live and just enjoy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, um, I, you know, one of the things that I enjoyed about talking with Congressman Clyburn was the fact of what a, he said, he calls his mother a renaissance woman, I called her a rebel, mm -hmm. because she actually was a cosmetologist, then she went back to school, got her teaching certificate, but never taught, just put the, uh, put the certificate, the diploma on the wall mm -hmm. to look at, mm -hmm. and went on and had several businesses. Right. It's pretty awesome. But you, people, you know, um, I, I, I'm always amazed when I see some people, they be, they're in a job and they're there for 40, 50, 60 years. I'm like, how boring can that be? I mean, you know, I, in my opinion, I have found that the diversity has been very good because I've had the opportunity to meet so many people from so many different backgrounds. Sure. You know, you work across racial lines, party lines. You learn so much when you are able to, to be trans. And so I w my husband allowed me the privilege to, you know, to be kind of be myself. And so I'm not stuck into anything. And basically uh, what I did was just like, well, I just enjoyed it. And we enjoy each other. He gives me the flexibility to be me. He will never tell me no. He'll say that's I understand your, he's a little bit older than you. Well, he loves me, and I love him, too. I love. I think that's a great thing. It is a great it's thing. It's an awesome thing. And but he, how did you get into county council down well, there in Richland County? Well, you you got to understand, I, I, this is a great story, too. Um, <laughs> I'm full of I great tell stories. you what, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors, and when we come back, we'll hear another great story from Joyce Dickerson, who's a Democratic candidate for senator to the great state of South Carolina. Don't you go away. Oh, that's right. We're right back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. My very special guest today is Joyce Dickerson. She is she's a Democratic candidate running. She is in the primary tomorrow. What do you think? Are you uh, excited about the primary is here? I am. I, I am. The, the past couple of nights have not been really able to sleep a lot because I'm just like, you know, basically what is going to go on, how it's going to go. But the, I'm not worried about it. The reason why I'm not is because I feel like uh, I have done my work. I've done everything that I could do, you know, to win. Sure. Uh, we have made sure that we try to visit as many counties as possible. I don't think we've missed too many. Um, we've met so many people, wonderful people across across the state. They've been so receptive, and the hospitality has been just really, really great. Um, we didn't uh, when I came into the into this campaign, I told Congressman McLaren, I said, you know, Congressman McLaren, this is going to be a grassroots campaign. And we believe that we have fulfilled that duty because we have really been in a grassroots. I'm, I'm, you may see me uh, along the highway pushing signs, you know. <laughs> I didn't have a problem doing that. And traveling this weekend, one of my aides said to me, you know, I thought you was really pretty, but when I saw you out there pushing those signs, I, I, I changed my whole attitude about you. I said, Hey, it's my campaign. If I see a corner that needs a sign and I got a trunk full of signs, I'm going to stop and put one out. 
I best. tell you what, in Columbia, <laughs> we were in Columbia Friday night. Oh my God, the signs are everywhere. They are everywhere. And guess what? I, we, and I was about to do a YouTube on mine because it was as fast, you, really, we were going to do the, the sign munchkin because as fast as we were putting them out, yep. someone was coming behind us, confiscating them. I'm like, didn't I put a sign there yesterday? And I'm back here today. That sign is gone. Then one lady said, oh, well, you know, I saw some signs, and we didn't have one in our yard, so we just got, I'm like, fine, oh. as long as they're in your yard, <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> but the state highway, you know, they were taking a few of them, but, you know, like I said, this has been a, a very good experience for me, uh, and I think it's a very good time for the state of South Carolina. I, I would love to see, uh, you know, what Rodney King said a long time ago, all of us just get along. We understand party differences, but I understand also that I believe that, you know, our differences should really strengthen us mm -hmm. and not hurt us and tear things down, but use it to build us up because you may have a good idea, sure. I may have a good idea, sure. and may I may not agree with your idea, but you can probably sell me on that idea so that we can learn how to compromise, especially if it's going to benefit the people we are elected to serve. Now, we're looking for a personal personal interest now that takes on a whole new gamut but sure. when you're looking for the at the constituents base then you set your personal stuff aside and you say well you know miss jane has got to be taken care of in her family so we need to focus on on the problem and one of the things sure. i have to well, say one of the things i wanted to talk to you about right. though before you got carried away here how did you end up being you were going to tell us the story of how you became, uh, got involved in county council at Richland County. I mean, that's a big, uh, what, 300, 400,000 people? Yes, yes. Oh, this is a great story. You're going to love it. Uh, and, and 1996, uh, I, was, um, I was asked to uh, run against a, 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 a Republican, a guy named um, Rick Quinn. And he and I, we laugh about this today. Rick was 30, blonde head, blue eyed. I'm black. 50 and uh, you know in the area that we were running in I think it was district 71 in 1996 before they redrew the lines and so um, I'm like you know I'm just not gonna let him beat me so I you know we were at a Democratic uh, convention and they said well it's a shame we don't have anyone to run against Rick Quinn and I said well what do you have to do to run against him and they told me um, you know you gotta pay 200 plus dollars, I believe it was at that time, and uh, and then fi file your paperwork. Now this is 1130, we're at a convention, okay? Filing stops at 12. Okay. I rushed over there and <laughs> filed and jumped into the race. And you didn't have any idea what I didn't have a clue what I was getting into. <laughs> and so, but I was not, a, I was not a, you know, a stranger to politics. I knew the workings, but I didn't, I never run on that run magnitude. Yourself, right. So basically, uh, he, he, you know, Tim said from the podium, he goes like, he was the chair, Tim Rogers. He said, we have a candidate to run against Rick Quinn. And you could hear a pin drop in that room. It was like, who is she? Where did she come from? What is her pedigree? I mean, you can just feel the ripples in the room. And uh, and I jumped up and I said, I'm, I'm Joyce. I'm Joyce Dickerson and I'm running. <laughs> and and uh, a lot of people knew me, but they had seen me like licking stamps and putting out signs and sitting at the desk and being a reception at the party. So I had been working for the party for a long time. So now I decided, well, I know what you guys do. So... I'm going to run. And we had the greatest time. Um, I think that year on $1,200, we ran a campaign on a shoestring budget and with no name recognition <laughs> and no family history. No pedigree. No pedigree. <laughs> and we, I think we came up with right at 40% of the vote. 40% with no money and doing like a little fish fry. And guess what? And my party said, well, don't go up in that area because you're probably not going to get a lot of votes. And that is the mistake I made. I believe I would have gotten my 11, 12 percent that I needed out of that area. But, I, but from that point now, when, say, when they tell me don't go somewhere, that's, that's exactly where, where I go. 
and I'm making my mark everywhere I go. And if I see a little red truck on the farm, I stop in my little green truck and go like, hey, I'm George Dickerson, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate. How are you doing today? And that's how I got started. I lost that race, mm -hmm. but a few years later, um, I, I, we reactivated the women. Uh, it just fired me up. I reactivated the women council, uh, and we started working. Do you working know with Edith Charles? I really do. Do you know Edith? I do. Yeah. yeah. Fired and, up and ready to and go. Ready to go. go. Well, yep. we've traveled a lot of Democratic conventions, so sure. I got really uh, into it and... Um, and then when the opportunity came after they redrew the lines the next time they drew it so it was I could actually get into this race and so Representative Howard said, Joyce, you know the area, you should run. And I said, Oh, I don't know about that. But then I thought about it, you know, it's an opportunity again. So I got into the race and I ran a very successful campaign and this is my third time uh, on okay. third the on county council, yes. Now, you have a large county council. What do you have, 11, 11 members? 11 members, yes. two women, yes. and nine guys, yes. you know, so it's, you know, um, so we have to deal with them every day. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think has made, uh, what do you think is the most important thing that county council is all about? What is county council about? County council is, you know, we are the county seat. Richmond County is the county seat. And we, uh, we, I just think we just have great, unique opportunities to serve our constituents. And basically, we follow state stature, and we fund so many um, Richland One school districts, and you know your libraries, and and your sheriff departments, and we interact with all of these agencies and all of the elected officials. But I think all it is basically about serving the people that we have been elected to serve, and making sure that their taxpayer dollars. We manage them really well. I am really happy to say that Richland County have a very healthy budget because we work on that budget uh, very hard, although sometimes it's a struggle, but we make sure we get through it and keep it stable. And, and, and for the past, we've been hiring people. We've not had to lay off anyone. We have a very healthy county. And, I'm, and I say that to, to applaud my, my, my colleagues that I serve with. We, even though we have a struggle and a challenge, we get through it and we come out on top every time. So we are, we are constituent driven. Or, now, mm -hmm. now, one of the things that you had told me off the air that this is the time where you're dealing with budgets on the hospitality taxes <laughs> that are co uh, collected. And this is difficult. It is. Because, what did you tell me? They come in one time and say they just want the money this one time and then they're back the next year with their hand out and they want more. More. Right. That is part of the problem of government, isn't it, Joyce? Yes, but this is a different kind of tax, okay? okay. This is a kind of tax that is, you know, basically generated for, for putting heads in beds. It's right. more recreational. No, so we have the same hospitality right, tax yeah. here. So in you're putting heads in beds, you're getting people to eat in the restaurants. So I really don't have a lot of a problem with that. I said when they tell me it's a one time, now just tell me it's one time and be honest with me, because if you're doing a very good service, and if you say, for instance, if you were going to put on, you got the Ann Foundation, and you're going to put on this great city ballet, mm -hmm. uh, and last year you put it on, and it was a great success, and you can show me how you brought X number of people, and our hotels were filled, and our restaurants were filled. I think the hotel industry would love you for that, and so you've generated money to come into that area. So if you come back to me and say, Joyce, you know, last year we, we, we only had 100 people, you know, just for a 100 people just attended that event. They, they slept in the hotels. They ate in the restaurants. And now this year we have, we have the ability to expand that. And we probably need a little bit more money to do that. Well, that's where the, the additional the funding is coming. But if they can prove to me that they, have, they can do this, hey, I'm all for it. And, but this is the challenge now. I have to go through all of them to make sure that you have you're telling me what you did, and sure. I think that's important. Too. Sure. The accountability is what I, I want to make sure of. But we have we've created a lot of ordinance agencies uh, where we know that they're going to generate X number of dollars, adventure things like that. So we don't have a problem with the museums and things like that. Well, you certainly have a lot down there. You're we bigger do. than we than we are <laughs> here, but. Uh, yeah, it's all about uh, heads in the beds and uh, people Eating in the restaurant. Yeah. So if you don't have events to bring people to your town, 
they're not going to be in your hotels and so your hotel managers are going to have a fit because their beds are empty and the restaurant people are going to have a fit because no one's eating in their restaurants. So the more people you can bring into your town, the better it is. Tourism is great. Yeah, it's a big, big part of South Carolina. Yes, it hey, is. it is time for uh, South Carolina Radio News. We'll be right back. Um, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? Or a college tuition hung on a wall? Or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. Oh, that's right. We're right back here, Sharp Facets Gallery. I'm Ann Eller here with Joyce Dickerson. Uh, she says, because it matters. That's your slogan. What does that mean, Joyce? That means because everything about family matters. Their health, their wealth, and their wellness matter to me. It does. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. Sure. And Well, as a, um, as a candidate, um, one of the things that we had talked a little bit off the air was about Social Security. Medicare, where we're headed with that. I mean, we're having some problems because of, uh, I think it used to be, what, 20, 25 people or something per one retiree, and now that number has reduced and it's going to be three or four in the next five or ten years supporting one person. How do you think Social Security can survive in today's world? Well, when I look at Social Security, I think it is... Um it, it can be. I, I think one of the things that I would propose right now, I was would, would be able to retire 65. Um, I believe since we're working longer. And because, because we have to, Joyce. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, I, 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 I beg to differ with that. I mean, okay. I know people say that, but I mean, I think it's about your lifestyle. I think it's the lifestyle you create, decide, determine whether or not you want to do that. But when you have someone, say for instance, in the Department of Education, just say that, and they've been there 40 years. Right. 40 years. And then not only that, you add on, you remember that we added on that you could tear it. Right. Okay, so now you're tearing, you're re so we're paying double. Yep. You see, we're paying double. I know. So you're telling me that you couldn't retire? No. You said, my th I believe. I believe. I believe. <laughs> okay, Joyce. Okay. I truly believe that we can. It's just a matter of how we plan earlier for our retirement. But I would propose that since we would dis we have elected now to work longer because we look younger. I mean, at my age, I feel great. I can probably do ten more years. So there's <laughs> Ernest Lee saying he feels good. Yeah, I okay. feel really good, and so you know, I can, a lot of people do not want to retire at 65 or 70. Because you got so many people who want they can go. Right. To, they want to go to eight. I got a lot of women, men working till eighty years old. Some of them ninety two, and she's still driving to a little, to a little community thing, so she can stay active. But I'm saying that to say that you could probably move it up. You know, move maybe the retirement move, age. Move, up. The, move the retirement age up, maybe three to five years. And I think you could probably during that time you could find some time where you can actually manage this a lot better. There are some ways that, there are, where there's a problem, I think you can find a solution. And I feel like if you are not a part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. Exactly. There's, that's the way I feel about it. So I think there are ways that you can work around that. And there are other things that are attached to Social Security that you may have to look at. And so, such you know, as? Such as maybe SSI. A lot of, if you look at a lot of SSI and how that comes out of the Office of the Social Security, I mean, there are a lot of things we could probably look at. I'm not saying you need to cut, but I, can, I guarantee you, from my experience, you can go and find a way to make sure that people have their needs met, but we can find a different way to do it and make sure that we stay within budget. And, and we can, in some time, we can probably... Are you for a budget. balanced budget? A I balanced know. budget? Uh, you know, um, being in government, um, <laughs> being in government, okay. Yeah, being in the local government, um, I believe it can happen. Sure. I really believe because I. Do you like, have a balanced budget down we there have, in Richland? Richland County have a we we balance our budget every year. That's why I said we have a very healthy balance. We have a very healthy county, and it's because we, the the members of my council, 
I mean, we work hard to keep our budget intact and we really make sure that we don't dip into the general funds as often. So we, we budget ourselves so we can have a healthy general fund. And I think it can be done. But here again is that you're only going to do it. Right. You can laugh. You're only, only going to do that if you got people who are worried about the constituents that we were elected to serve mm -hmm. rather than personal interests. Sure. And self interest, you know, special interest. Now, when you got someone telling you, if you know, say for instance, I'm getting money from whatever, whatever, this say true love company, they've invested in me, or I'm a banker, and they said, now, Joyce, I don't want this to happen, then you know, you got to figure out where your loyalty is. I am for the people, of the people, by the people, and that's what I want all the people to know that I have no personal interest. I can go home and sleep every day till 12 o'clock if I want to, and I don't worry about a thing. But my, I'm in this because I care about people because they matter. I think their their homes matter, their family lives matter. Look at a decline in middle class that disturbs me. When the middle class go, mm -hmm. guess what? You're only going to have the rich and the poor. The rest of us will have to fend for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's so, true. That's, that's right. True. Mm -hmm. That's true. Now, um, one of the other things that I know that you want to see is uh, immigration reform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? What? How do you see immigration reform? Well, you know, I, those people who we have to look at those who are here illegally. Mm -hmm. But I think, say for instance, if I was a person here basically illegally, you know, just and then you know I had three or four kids here, mm -hmm. and the children now was they were born here. Uh, they're now 15, 20, getting probably ready to go to college. I would have a step. That kid doesn't have a clue whether they came from New Mexico or, out, you know, or Paris. You, they don't, but they've lived here. So I think we need to figure out a way to do this. And I think, like I said, if there's a problem, you need to find, look to find a solution. And well, I think we can do that. Well, let me ask you something, Joyce, because this blew me away when I read this article yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what was it? Uh, two years ago, we had 65, roughly 6,500 children coming across the borders with no parents. Mm -hmm. Last year, it was 13,165 coming across the border. Mm -hmm. This year, by September 30th, which is the end of their fiscal year, they say it's going to be close to 80,000 children. Those are illegal. Illegal yeah. children Those that are just coming across the border without parents. Not only are they coming from Mexico, but they're coming from Central America. And the children know if they come across the border, our people were having to house them in um, barracks. Um, it is becoming a very big problem. It's a serious problem. Absolutely. 80,000 80, children. 80,000 people. And guess where they'll be going? They'll be getting into our system, into the Medicare system. They'll be getting into... We'll so have, how do we do this? How, what do we do? Well, that, that is a serious problem. That and is children. A, yeah, I, now, when I talked about the immigration reform, I was not talking about those who came here. Right. I, was, I am referring to those who were actually born here. To the illegal, anchor babies. Yeah, the anchor, yeah. anchor out of, you know, to illegal immigrants. Those were the ones. Now, I do think we have got to figure out a way to uh, apprehend those who are coming in here illegal like that. I mean, if they come, they're coming from like across the border, 80,000. We, we cannot absorb that. No, we that can't. government, that local government or that state government cannot absorb that kind yeah. of, of, of Arizona, funding. Texas, right. and that Southern California. That is a lot California. to put on, on, on the local governments, on the, on their, on the state and local governments. Sure. You cannot absorb that expense. Do you have any idea what we could do? I mean, I, I was just blown away when I read these figures, and it is, well, the you, kids are being sent across, and they are in that 12, 13, 14, 15 year old. Well, you know what, you know what, I hear again, I think it's when somebody has got to open up some dialogue, and that means that, you know, someone has got to take the leadership and go like, if, say for instance, they're coming from New Mexico, mm -hmm. okay, all right, Mr. Government here, it's time we got your children. So you need to subsidize. I mean, you know, we need to figure out a way. If they feel like they're getting a better opportunity here, what can we do to, to keep them there to make your government work better? 
so that they can remain in your country. And sure. we, that, I mean, I, I think I, that's, a lot, yeah, a lot I think that, that's what you're going to have to do. People just got to get tough and make some decisions. Well, you know, one of the other things is a lot of these children are coming from Central America, so they're coming through Mexico, right. uh, too. So right. that's a big problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we have uh, roughly 13 million undocumented immigrants here in the United States. What do you think? Should we grant them amnesty? What should be done for immigration aspects? How many times did you say 13? 13 million. 13 million, that is a lot. Look at how they're, you know, basically I would think, what are their contributions to America? Um, what, are you, what are you contributing? Are you in the workforce? Are you, I mean, am I supposed to be paying your Medicaid bills and all of these other things? But are they in the workforce? Where are they working? Are they they're in undocumented college? illegals, let's Illegal. say. You're just, just saying we're illegal. They're okay. getting paid cash across the counter mm -hmm. to, uh, well, to the, survive. Well, then the persons who are the persons who are hiring them, mm -hmm. they need to be put in check. I think that's probably where the problem is. It's like if you know that, and it, then I think that's we need to be working on something with with their employers. That has to be worked out. Should we send these people back? Should we, uh, you know, I mean, that's 13 million people. That's a lot of people. Should we send them back? Do we need the immigrants to, to uh, pick the peaches in South Carolina yes, and the different do. crops and yes, this type of thing? Yeah. If you look at the way the culture has changed over the years, um, basically the pe persons who used to do that work are no longer into that workforce. So if not, then the peaches would sit in the field and die. The lettuce would die in the field. Mm -hmm. They... You, I believe you could do something economically from an economic standpoint where you could work. They don't have to probably be here. Um, they could find some way to kind of, I think, pay their way to do the work, not being so much a part of falling in for us to take care of. Mm -hmm. But I do think they can contribute while they're here. I don't think we need to absorb their expense for that sure. many people. But as long as they are contributing to it, I think we can, we can work away to get them back home or find a way where someone can help us, you know, work them into the system so that they are legal. You know, I think, like I said, there's a, that's a problem. We need to find But you're not just for granting amnesty. I, no, I just think, we, I think, no, I think there's a way we should find a better way to do that. But I'm not just saying put them on a ship and send them back. You know, you got to understand, I'm African American, okay? Right. I came over I never here. guessed. <laughs> <laughs> and being an African American, you know, we got our stories to tell too. So, well, our um, country has been built on immigration, right? And so, but I mean, there's a way to do it. There's a way to do it. There's a way to do it, and I truly agree. So, I think there is a way, and we can find a solution. And I'm thinking, you make a contribution, and you can work on the solution. You know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, we are here with Joyce Dickerson, and she is running for the Democratic seat. She's actually running against, would be running against Tim Scott if she captured the Democratic nomination. So we're going to be right back. Hey, if you got a question for Joyce, give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. That's right. We're right back here, Sharp Facets Gallery. I just found out something very interesting about Joyce Dickerson. You wrote a book. I did. What's the name of the book? Then there is 101 Incredible Women Who Influenced My Life From My House to the White House. It's a <laughs> That's long, a nice short title. That's a long, nice short title. But you got to look at what it says. Okay. Basically, from my house to the White House. And I'm sitting here today because of those women. <clears throat> who influenced my life. And I can look back at every one of them. Even when I when I when I put one lady in and one of my, my best friends who just she passed away less than a month ago. And she said, Joyce, I can't believe you put her in there. I said, Yes I did. I said, because you've got to understand, had she been a Democrat, she would have never been where she is today. So she has done a lot and where she came from, you look at her, she's tough, she's you know, she's I mean, she's affluent, she's astute, I mean, she's accomplished. Mm -hmm. And these women were women who were accomplished. And I wanted to know, how did they do that? So I studied their lives. And I started with my daughter, who lost her husband seven years, nine years ago. And I said, I don't know how to help you. So, you know, we talked about it. And I watched her, you know, deal with the loss of her husband, 
only having a dog to be there with her, that her husband mm -hmm. like had a fit to make sure she had Sasha. Right. So her and Sasha got through that. Right. And I watched how she handled that. Boy, that really inspired me. So if I had to talk to someone else, I can say, you know, you might want to talk to my daughter. She might be able to help you. This is how she dealt with it. Sure. And I looked at my mom who had eight children. And she had eight children under the worst sometimes of circumstance. And my mother was really, really fair. I mean, she couldn't take the sun that much. But I saw her, you know, little knuckles. You know how she never let us go to bed hungry. We slept on iron pillowcase sheets. And she took a smooth and iron and ironed those pillowcases and sheets so that we had nice, clean beds to sleep in. I saw her when the stove went out, she would put wood in a heater to make sure that the pots, we had food. And I watched her, and I saw how dedicated she was to her family. That made me love my family even more. And when I see my daughter with, her, with my husband, I see her, you know, with her dad, and they just got the best relationship in the world. And I said, oh my God, that's what I miss with my father. Because my mother and my father, they separated when I was young. Now, I'm the oldest of eight. She remarried. And so, you know, then I, you know, at a point in time, I had to leave home. So I had to learn from other women. Mm -hmm. And this one lady who passed away, she said to me, Joyce, you have to be strong. And as long as you don't have to go through one door to get to yours, you'll be okay. So, you know, you just, I think about all of those women who poured into me. And they made me be the best wife. And one woman told me, so Joyce, if you go sleep with your husband, don't talk about it. That is the greatest point I ever heard. When you think well, about but some of the most fun you can have is talking about your men. Now. Well, you, yeah. I mean, she didn't want you to talk about them negatively. You sure, will not hear me say anything negatively about my husband. I might, you know, you know, some days, you know, we've been together so long, we understand each other. Sure. But the fact of the matter, he has been my supporter, and I am not going to say, say that. Have we had a perfect marriage? No. But the fact of the matter, we have had great times raising the children, and we didn't always have a lot, but we made sure. We told them, don't you ever worry about being in anything because you think your parents can't afford it. You let that be our worry. You know, and that is the thing, Joyce, that is missing in a lot of instances in today's world, is that family relationship, that taking care of your children and making sure that, quote, they don't worry about things. This has been a hard, hard time for the last few years, and society, to me, is just changing so fast. We no longer seem to have to have a two-parent family. It's a nice thing to have, mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem to be the norm anymore, and that frightens me for mm -hmm. our children and for the future. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think it does, too. Uh, it, it, you know, like I was saying, uh, looking, looking at my family structure, and I think I learned from the older women, and I watched them, and I was determined that my family was going to be a family. And I was determined that I was not going to let selfish, personal things get into the way to, to cause my family any damage in any way. Sure. And so um, my husband being in the military, when he was gone, we tried to make sure that I, I tried to make sure that the home was secure, that the children were taken care of, that the bills were paid. And he only wanted $10 when, you know, when he got paid. Just send me $10. He allowed me to manage the budget. And when he came home and, and he retired, we, we laid out everything. And I looked at my list and it was like long. And he had five things on his list. I'm like, uh-uh, this is not going to work. We balanced that out. We learned how not to fight about money because we had a bounce check one time. And guess what happened? We figured out because we were both writing out of the same checkbook, sure. that was a problem. Right now, the money goes into the, the checking account. He pays the bills. He gives me what he what's left. I don't even worry about it. You know, I know he's always been fair. And so we don't have money fights. And I feel like this is a lot of problems with a lot of marriages. There are a lot of problems with finances, you know. So I don't have that problem. We have so, a great, healthy family. So now that we've learned all about you, Joyce Dickerson, what can you tell us? How does all this experience roll it up into um, two minutes and tell us why you should be the next senator from the great state of South Carolina? Thank you so much, Ann. I have been waiting for this moment. 
I tell you, I believe that this is a great time for me in my life. It is the greatest opportunity that I've had in a long, long time. I believe that, you know, I told you earlier that for those who can't take it, I'm very spiritual. And I'm, and I'm very much a believer. And I believe when God brings you to something, he'll see you through it. And I believe he brought me to this point. And open up this door. This door has opened, and I don't believe he's going to close it. You know, because when he opens the door, no one can close it. And when he shut it, nobody can open it. So with that said, I am excited to have the opportunity to serve the people of South Carolina. I believe I mentioned earlier that it's not about my personal interest, but it's about the people interest. I am concerned about the people of South Carolina and their quality of life. I think it's so important that we do everything we can to sustain our middle class. When our middle class go, everything goes. And so I believe that the middle class, have to, we have to work on the middle class, create jobs to sustain our middle class, create jobs so that we can get, or once again, have that family structure. People are working themselves crazy. That's why I believe we don't have a lot of family time because so many moms and dads now are having to work three and four jobs. I this want to change is, that. This is WCRS right Thank here you. in Greenwood. You can go ahead, Joyce. You can finish. I just yes. have to say that. Yeah. Okay. And so I want to change that. I want to, I want to make sure that I hear from them the people of South Carolina, which I've heard over the past six months. I have been going all over the state for six months listening to their concerns. The veterans have come to me. Yes, ma'am, I love you for what you want to do for us. Thank you for caring for us. Unfortunate now we got everybody want to think about the veterans, but we were talking about you all six months ago, okay? And I'm excited to have the opportunity to serve you. I hope you give me that opportunity. Go to the polls tomorrow. Remember to vote, Joyce, to be your voice. Thank you so very much. All right. Thank you so much, Joyce Dickerson. She is running in the Democratic primary uh, tomorrow. So uh, please get out there and vote. We're going to hear the news, then I've got another call in. I do believe we're going to have Molly Spearman on the line with us. So don't you go away.